We are very happy that you're present with us, and God has more in store for all of us. Our welcome is both for the local audience and for those who are watching online. Welcome, welcome. We're so glad to have you back for this amazing uh, seminar, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, we are coming live uh, from Wichita Hills campus, Wichita Hills College campus, and again, I will repeat with this Amazing seminar from Revelation, a revelation of Jesus Christ. And we have four speakers. You will be hearing more as we progress throughout the week, so please stay tuned. And we're going to be taking in an exciting multimedia prophecy seminar through these presentations. And the wish of our speaker is to connect people with Jesus Christ. We have nothing to give. So Christ has it all. And our speaker today is Joshua Holly, coming from Oklahoma. And he is studying for gospel ministry. Joshua has a passion to show people how Jesus can break the chain of addiction, the chain of a life of crime and things like that, because he himself have taste that power. And he has seen that we can overcome by the word of our testimonies, but also by the blood of the Lamb. That is the center of the book of Revelation. So today, we were looking forward to hear a message entitled, guess what it is? You've heard it already. A dream come true. A dream come true. To me, that already sounds interesting. Amen. All right, stay tuned. Welcome to our Revelation of Jesus Christ seminar. And I've entitled the message today, A Dream Come True. And it's a powerful, eye-opening message. It's one that's been a blessing to my life. And I know that if you have pen and paper, that you can take notes. And I know the Lord will bless you too. But before we get in the message, I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads and pray with me. Father, as we, as we open up your word, Lord, we want to ask for the spirit of truth, Father, to be here. We pray that you would guide our minds, Father, into all truth. Father, we pray for a fresh revelation of Jesus Christ. Pray that you would speak in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if there's one thing that we need, if there's one thing that God wants us to have, friends, if there's one thing that God needs us to have, it's faith. God wants us to trust in him. God wants us to believe in him. God needs us to have faith in him, friends. A real faith that's built on evidence, not a blind faith, friends. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The what? The evidence of things not seen. God wants us to have an intelligent faith. A faith that's not, not blind faith is not faith, friends. Blind faith is ignorance. God wants us to have a faith that is built on evidence, friends, a true faith. And God wants to give us that faith, friends. And the Bible says in Romans 10, verse 17, it says, So then faith cometh by what? Hearing. By hearing. By he and, and hearing by what? Word. Hearing the word of God. There are things that are written in the Bible, friends. Amazing, eye-opening things, friends where God shows himself that he is God. Did you know that? Amazing things, friends. God has given us his word, friends, given us things that are written in the Bible to build our faith, friends. We can gain faith by hearing the word of God. And I want to tell you today, friends, there is a specific story in the Bible. There is a specific chapter in the Bible where God proves himself. Are you hearing me? where God proves and where God reveals himself as God, friends, that, that the Bible is not some working of man's creation, but God himself has revealed himself in his word, friends. And it's a powerful story, and it's the, door, it's the story of Daniel chapter 2. Friends, I, I would say that Daniel chapter 2 is the most powerful chapter in all the Bible, because it literally, friends, it is the chapter in the Bible that proves that there's a God in heaven, it proves that the Bible is a divine book. It proves that God Almighty is in control, friends. And you know, I want to encourage you today that if there's some of you that are here sitting in this audience, or if there's some of you that are watching today, think maybe you already know the story of Daniel too. Think maybe you've already heard it. I want to encourage you most of all, 
those ones that think they already know the story, to pay the closest attention. Because God wants to give you a fresh revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? He does, friends. He does. You know, I remember I went to a seminar um, similar to this one about 10 years ago. And as I walked into the meeting, um, there was a church member who was walking out of the meeting. And I heard this church member, this church member, say to another church member, he said, I'm going home. He said, I've heard it a thousand times. You know, I think back and I think, how sad. How sad it is that that church member had heard that message a hundred times, a thousand times, and he still didn't get it. He still didn't get it. You know, friends, it don't matter how many times I read the Bible, I never get tired of hearing Jesus speak to me. Never. I never get tired of telling people about Jesus, friends. I pray that you don't get weary today, friends, and I pray that you let Jesus speak to your heart, friends. The story of Daniel chapter 2, we, we may all know the story. It's a mighty story of the kingdom of Babylon. Um, king Nebuchadnezzar was the ruler then, friends. It was a mighty kingdom. It was a luxurious kingdom, very prosperous kingdom. And the story begins in Daniel chapter 2 with Nebuchadnezzar laying down to sleep. And as he laid down to sleep one night, Nebuchadnezzar started thinking. As he saw his mighty kingdom, as he saw the kingdom that he had built up, Nebuchadnezzar started wondering how long his kingdom would last. He started wondering what would happen in the future if his kingdom would last forever. And as Nebuchadnezzar drifted off to sleep, God did something amazing, friends. Something so amazing. Gave him a powerful dream. Friends, and we're going to see today that in this dream, God predicted the rise and fall of world empires all the way from the time of Babylon to our day today. And I want you to think about this for a moment. This book was written thousands of years ago. And me and you, we have the privilege to stand here today and look back on history and see the amazing fulfillment of God's word. What a blessing, huh? And you know, as God gave Nebuchadnezzar this dream, um, he had this dream and he woke up in the story in Daniel chapter 2 and he was startled. And as he woke up, there was a problem. He could not remember the dream. Has that ever happened to you? I remember one time I was having a dream. I had a roommate at this time. And I woke up screaming. I was having a nightmare. And I woke my roommate up and he was like, man, what's, what's wrong? I said, man, I was having a nightmare. He said, man, what was it about? I said, I don't know. But it was, <laughs> but it was scary. I know that. And that's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar right here. As he had this dream, friends, he woke up and he could not remember the dream. And as he woke up, couldn't remember the dream, he called for all of his soothsayers, all of his astrologers, all of his magicians, all of these so-called divinely enlightened people, friends. And as he called those people together, he said, I've had a dream. I need you to tell me the dream and make known the interpretation. They said, King, you tell us the dream. We'll let you know the interpretation. The king said, no, 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 no. It's not going to work like that. He said, you're going to tell me the dream and the interpretation or else. And friends, there's only one that could reveal a secret like that, friends. And it was not those imposters. It was not the astrologers. It was not the soothsayers. It was not the magicians, friends. Only God in heaven could reveal something like that, friends. And they weren't able to. So the first question I have today for you is, why did God give the Babylonian king this dream? Why did he give him a dream? What was the purpose of God giving Nebuchadnezzar this dream? The Bible tells us in verse 28, the Bible says, but there is a God in heaven who reveals Secret. So God wanted to reveal himself to Nebuchadnezzar, but not just Nebuchadnezzar, friends. God wanted to reveal himself to you and to me and those watching today, friends. But that there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. So God was not only revealing himself to Nebuchadnezzar, but God was revealing to him what was going to come in the latter days. What was going to happen in the future? How amazing is that? that God came to reveal himself to Nebuchadnezzar, friends. And you know, I have some homework for you today. Because we're not going to go through all of Daniel chapter 2. We're not going to read verse by verse, friends. But I, I've, I've got some homework for you to do. Today, I want you to go as soon as this service is over and read Daniel chapter 2. 
And I want you to take a highlighter. Or I want you to take a pen. And I want you to mark how many times you see that word right there, used, reveal, in Daniel chapter 2. Whether it's reveal or revealed or reveal it and see if God doesn't reveal something to you special today. Can you do that today? That's your homework, and I'm going I'm to hold you to that. I'm going to ask you here in just a little bit if you've read it. And how many times you see that word right there used? Because God wants to reveal himself to you and to me today, friends, and I'm excited. Next question is, when the king's counselors failed to reveal and interpret the dream, what was Nebuchadnezzar's command? What did he command once, once he found out they could not interpret the dream? And the Bible says in verse 12, it says, For this reason the king was angry and very wroth and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. The king was mad. He did not want to hear it. He did not want to hear that they could not interpret it. So the king commanded that they all should be killed, all the wise men. Not just the wise men that were present, though. Slay the wise men even that were absent. And friends, among some of those wise men that were absent was a young man named Daniel. He was a captive from, from Israel, and he had just been trained in the king's service. And so when Daniel learned about the death decree, what did God, what did he ask of the king, and what did he tell his friends? The Bible says in verse 16, So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time, that he might tell the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah and his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the wise, rest of the wise men of Babylon. So Daniel went into King Nebuchadnezzar and requested time that he might go and ask, ask the God of heaven to reveal this thing to Daniel. And friends, Daniel went home and did the only thing that he knew to do, friends. And he got on his knees and he prayed. And I want to tell you something today, friends. There is power in prayer. Power, friends. Move the arm of God. There is power in prayer, friends. What we can see from this right here, friends, is that God answers prayers because God did answer prayer, friends. When Daniel got on his knees and prayed not only for his own life, but for all those lives that were in danger, God came to him and revealed this secret in a night vision, friends. There's a God in heaven that can reveal secrets, amen? amen. So when the Lord revealed the dream to Daniel, to whom did Daniel give praise and credit? And the Bible says in verse 23, I thank thee and praise thee, O God of my fathers. There is a God in heaven. There is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. You know, friends, this should give us comfort and hope tonight, friends. Especially with all the different things going on in our world today. It should give us hope and comfort knowing, friends, that there's a God in heaven. A God in heaven that can reveal secrets, friends. It should comfort us knowing that the world is in God's hands. We might see all kinds of things going on around us, and we might want to be tempted to get fearful, friends, but we can take rest in knowing that God Almighty is in control, and there's no need to worry. There's no need to worry, friends. God wants us to know that He's trustworthy and that He's Almighty. So what two objects did Daniel say the king saw in his dream? The Bible says in Daniel 2, 31, You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. The first thing the king saw was a great image made of the following mineral elements. So as the king had this dream, friends, and saw this mighty statue, we saw that the head was of gold. In the dream, the, the breast and arms were of silver, the belly and thighs of bronze, the legs of iron, the feet were of iron and clay. You know, I could imagine right now, as Daniel is revealing this dream to Nebuchadnezzar, I can imagine Nebuchadnezzar's jaw hitting the floor on the edge of his seat, completely amazed that there was a God in heaven that could reveal secrets, that there was somebody to trust. I, could, I would just love to have seen the face of Nebuchadnezzar as God Almighty was revealing himself. Praise God. I'm so thankful for the Bible. And you know, friends, as we see all these different things, we see the head of gold, we see in this dream that it had a breast and arms of silver, 
The belly and thighs were of bronze. The legs of iron. The feet were of iron and clay. You know, we, we, we wonder what, maybe what some of these things mean. You know, friends, I want to tell you today that the only safe way to interpret the Bible and prophecy is to allow the Bible to explain itself. You know, it's really interesting. I have heard so many different theories about this chapter right here. I've heard so many different people. You can go to the local Christian bookstore and you can probably find a hundred books that talk about this image right here. And what I heard one theory that said the head of gold represented the Illuminati and that the, the breast and arms of silver represented the trilateral commission and all this foolish nonsense, just foolishness. Man's theories, friends. God doesn't want us to guess. We don't need to guess what the Bible means, friends. We don't, anytime you get to anywhere in prophecy, the Bible oh, always interprets itself. When you get to man-made theories is where confusion sets in, friends. And the Bible calls that Babylon. We don't need confusion. God is not a God of confusion, friends. God is a God of clarity, and he wants us to understand what all these things mean. The Bible is the only safe way to interpret the Bible, friends. So what does the Bible say the head of gold represents? What does the Bible say? It says right there in verse 38, Daniel said, you, King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, you are this head of gold. Not the Illuminati, not the trilateral commission, not President Trump, not Obama, not these different things. It says, you are this head of gold. And that's rightly fitting. King Nebuchadnezzar was the, was the ruler of Babylon, and they ruled from 612 um, BC to around 539 BC. And it was a mighty, mighty kingdom, aptly represented by, by gold. And next question is, would the Babylonian kingdom last forever? That is what Nebuchadnezzar was wondering as he lay down to sleep that night. He was wondering what was going to happen to his kingdom. As he saw his mighty kingdom, he just didn't see any way that kingdom was going to be conquered, friends. But the Bible tells us something in verse 39. It says, But after you shall arise another kingdom, inferior to yours. And friends, that's exactly what happened. Babylon's supremacy would not last forever. The Bible says that another kingdom would rise that is inferior to Babylon. And that's what happened, friends. In 539 BC, led by Cyrus the Persian, they conquered Babylon. And they ruled the world from 539 B.C. to 331 B.C. And you know what's interesting? You know, the dream represented the Medo-Persian Empire by a chest of silver, right? And it said, all, and during the time of the Medo-Persian Empire, all taxes had to be paid in silver. Just a little insight. That's really powerful. You really think about it. It says, so what, what metal would represent the kingdom that followed Medo-Persia? And the Bible says, then another kingdom another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule the whole earth. So we are looking at world empires. We're not just looking at major countries. We're not just looking at people like the United States of America or China or Russia. We are looking at world empires, friends. And in 331 BC, the brass kingdom of Greece came into power when Alexander the Great conquered the Medes and Persians, the Medes and the Persians at the Battle of Arbella in 331 BC. And Greece remained in power until about 168 BC. And you know, the Greek soldiers were called brazen coated, which is really interesting because of their, their bronze um, armor. You know, God, God, God wanted us to know these things, friends. Next question is what metal represents the fourth kingdom? And it says, And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. And friends, in 168 BC, you know what's really interesting right here? I just want to point out that, you know, we looked at, we looked at a dream from the Bible, right? We see how the Bible showed Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and now we're looking at history, looking at history to see the accurate fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Do y'all see this? Is this not amazing to you? Looking, seeing back 2,000 years ago, how we take the Bible, we mix it with history, and we see proof that God is God, friends. That's amazing to me. It's eye-opening to me. And the Iron Monarchy of Rome conquered the Greeks in 168 BC, and they enjoyed world supremacy until Rome was captured by the Ostrogoths around 476 AD. And it was Rome that was ruling the world whenever Jesus was born. So just to recap real quick, we see that the gold was represented by Babylon, 
We see that the silver was represented by Medo-Persia. We see the bronze was represented by Greece. And we see iron represented by Rome. And you know something else that's, even, that's so powerful? You know, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Does everybody know about those? Around 1946. And they date those back way before the time of Jesus. And it had the book of Daniel in it, friends. So we know that this is not something that man has made up since these things happen. We have proof that these things were written before these things were all taking place, friends. We can believe in the word of God, friends. Question number 10 is what would happen after the fall of the Roman Empire? It just keeps getting more powerful too right here, friends. So what would happen after the Roman Empire? The dream says, or Daniel says, whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And friends, again, we go to history, and history tells us that in AD 476, the Roman Empire began to crumble, and it was overtaken by barbaric tribes. And what's amazing is history tells us that Rome, when Rome fell, friends, that it was divided into exactly 10 different tribes, which evolved into modern Europe today. And hopefully you can see some of those on the screen. There were the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Franks, the Vandals, the Alemannians, the Sueves, the Anglo-Saxons, the Hurls the Lombards, and the Burgundians, seven of them still exist in Europe today. For example, the Anglo-Saxons became the, Fr- the English, the Franks became the French, the Alemannians became the Germans, and the Lombards became the Italians. Would these ten kingdoms ever succeed in uniting? And what does the Bible say about that? It says, As you saw, the iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. This is a powerful stuff right here, friends. You know, history, people have tried to unite Europe for, for a long time, friends. There was people through marriages, through alliances. There was um, Charlemagne, there was Hitler, there was Mussolini. All these people have tried to unite Europe, friends, but the Bible says they will not adhere one to another. It's not going to happen. You know, Revelation 13 tells us, friends, that there's going to be an attempt to unite the whole world in religious things, but the Bible says that the world will always be split politically. It will never come under one world government, ever. And friends, we see the accurate fulfillment even of that today, friends, as Europe still stands divided today. So who will set up the final kingdom? And in those days, in the day, and in the days of the, these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. You know, friends, the whole purpose of this prophecy. As we look back and we see the complete, accurate fulfillment of Bible prophecy, it is so that we can look at the end of this prophecy here and see that Jesus is the next kingdom, that Jesus is coming, friends, and we can know for certainty, we can know that Jesus is coming, friends. It's a fact. It's not a theory. It's not my beliefs. It is a fact, friends. Jesus is coming again, and we can believe it because we have evidence. God does not want us to have a blind faith, friends. He wants us to weigh the evidence, to test him, and we can know that Jesus is It's coming back, and I'm excited about it, friends. I'm tired of this world. I don't like living here, friends. I don't like anything this world has to offer, friends. And I look at this prophecy, my heart is thrilled with joy and hope, knowing that Jesus is coming for you and for me and for those watching. And I'm so thankful that Jesus is coming. Just to recap, friends, so Babylon represented gold. Medo-Persia was the silver. Greece was the bronze. Rome was iron. And we see that the last kingdom, friends, the last kingdom will be Jesus. And so the next question, sorry, what does the stone do to the other kingdoms? The Bible says you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, 
and break them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer fleshing floor. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Next, friends, it is a complete replacement to the earth as we know it, friends. We can know that Jesus is coming back, friends. It says all earthly kingdoms will eventually be crushed by the coming of Christ. Thank God that he will win the great controversy. Praise God. So friends, after hearing Daniel's clear interpretation of the dream, as Nebuchadnezzar was listening, as Nebuchadnezzar was seeing that his dream was being interpreted, what did Nebuchadnezzar say about the Lord? It says, what... There we go. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the king of kings, and the revealer of secrets. Since you could reveal this secret, God in heaven, friends, revealed himself to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar confessed that there was a God in heaven, and it was the God of Daniel, friends. So thankful, friends, that God has given us this today, that we can know for certainty that he's, Jesus is coming, friends. And how exciting is that? What exciting news to know that Jesus is coming again, friends. And again, as we look at the world today, friends, and as we see all the messed up things that are taking place in this world, we can find comfort knowing, friends, that Jesus is coming, that we don't have to stress. We don't have to worry about the coronavirus. We don't have to worry about all the other things around us, friends. We can take comfort in knowing that God is in control, that he has the world in his hands. You know, and I'm so thankful for that today. You know, I want to tell you today, friends, that God is calling for a decision. You know, as God is telling us all these things, as he is proving himself to you, as he is proving himself to me afresh, you know, as I was studying this recently, my heart was thrilled with joy every time I was going over these slides, friends, as God was just freshly revealing himself to me. Amazing things that God has shown us, friends, and God is calling for us today to make a decision, friends. As he gives us this information, as he reveals himself to you and me, as we see that there's a God in heaven that has the world in his hand, that there's a God in heaven that has everything under control. He wants to see these things, weigh the evidence, and make a decision, friends. Make a decision to serve him faithfully. You know, to let, let go of the world. You know, let, I'll tell you, I know it's hard. I know it is sometimes, you know. But let go of the world. Let go of the world and grab hold of Jesus and serve him. This is what God is seeking to do for us today, friends. He is seeking to build our faith up that we can know that he's in control and give our whole hearts to him, friends. And serve. God is calling for you today, friends. God is appealing to you. God is appealing to you, asking for you to make a decision, friends. And you know what's so beautiful is this promise right here found in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2. The Bible says, now, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, friends. You are not promised tomorrow, friends. Now is the day of salvation. Think about that. No matter where, where your life has been, no matter where, what you've done with your life, friends, no matter what you have, you may wake up today, friends. Maybe some of you are watching. Maybe some of you are here today. Maybe you realize you've wasted 50 years of your life. You woke up today and realized you've wasted your whole life. It's okay, friends. It's okay. Jesus says now is the accepted time to accept him. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day that God can make you new. Now is the day, friends, to make a decision for Jesus. Let go of the world. Grab a hold of Jesus, friends, and let him change your life. Now, friends, is the day of salvation.
Christ is near you, know you God of strength. Now is the day of salvation, let him wash your sins away. Now is the day of salvation to take. is near you, though you've gone astray. Now is the day of salvation. Let him wash your sins away. Let him wash your sins Friends, as, as Jesus is tugging at our hearts this morning, how many of you would like to have Jesus wash your sins away? Completely make you whole and clean, friends. And I know, I know that God is tugging at our hearts right now, friends. You know, I just want to encourage you today, friends, to give it all to Jesus. Serve him faithfully, friends. Let go of the world, friends, and serve Jesus, friends. How many would like to do that today? Yeah? Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Lord, we want to say thank you so much, Father, for being a God that reveals secrets, for being a God that has revealed himself to us, Lord. And Father, we thank you that you have given us this day, Father, the day of salvation, Lord. And we're so thankful, Father, that you forgive us for our past, Lord. And Father, as each of us, Lord, make that commitment today to accept that gift, to believe that you are coming back, Father. I pray that you would forgive us, Lord, and give us the strength, Lord, to serve you with all of our hearts, Father. And Lord, again, we thank you so much, Father, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so our, our next meeting will be Wednesday, and the message is entitled, The Coming King. So you don't want to miss that. Please make sure you're here Wednesday night. It'll be a blessing, and we'll hear more about the coming of Christ and hear more of God's Word explained to us so clearly. So thank you. We are so pleased you could join us here at Watchtower Hills Academy and College. And if you have enjoyed this presentation as much as I have, like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Also, if you would like to support the making of these programs, you can find the donation information in the description below. Thank you so much for joining us, and may God richly bless you.